Good afternoon. Uh, I hope everybody is able to hear my voice and uh, see the slides of our first uh, presenter. I would like to thank you all for being here at this time of the day. And I would like uh, to thank the International League Against Epilepsy for their uh, organizing uh, efforts and uh, International League Against Epilepsy EMR for their uh, support. Uh, today, we're going to have two speakers with uh, two interesting uh, topics. I'm going to be presenting the first speaker and my co-chair, Dr. Shahnaz Priki. She's going to present the second speaker. We're going to be having the first talk for less than an hour. And at the end, we're going to have some time for questions. Please write your questions in the Q&A section of uh, the application, and we'll try to read them aloud and uh, have our guest speaker address them. So if you're ready, we're going to start with our first uh, presentation. It's going to be by uh, the laureate Professor Ingrid Sheffer. She's a physician scientist who works as a pediatric neurologist and a biotologist at the University of Melbourne and Austin Health she has led the field of epilepsy genetics over more than 25 years in collaboration with Professor Samuel Perkovich and molecular genetists. The, this resulted in identification of the first epilepsy gene and many more genes subsequently. Professor Sheffer has described many novel epilepsy syndromes and defined genotype phenotype correlation of many genetic diseases. Her major interests are in the genetics and epilepsies, epilepsy syndromology and classification, and translational research. She collaborates on research focused on the genetics of speech and language disorders, autism spectrum disorders, cortical malformations, and intellectual disability. She led the first major classification of the epilepsies in three decades for the International League Against Epilepsy in 2017. She has received many awards, including the 2007 American Epilepsy Society Clinical Research Recognition Award, the L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Laureate for the Asia Pacific Region for 2012, and the IRAE Ambassador for Epilepsy Award. In 2014, she was elected as a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and also as Vice President and Foundation Fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. She was a co-recipient of the 2014 Australian Prime Minister's Prize for Science, and she was awarded the Order of Australia in 2014. In 2018, she was elected as a Fellow of the Royal Society. In 2020, she became the second president of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. Professor Ingrid, thank you for being with us here. I would think late in the day for you, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thanks, Dr. Abdullah, and thank you all for being here and the honor to uh, present to you on a, on a topic that's really close to my heart, the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. So here are my disclosures. And then to move on to this this concept of developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, really describing what we mean by this process, uh, this term, which we coined really back in 2017 in the classification of the epilepsies. And um, what this means really is around the, this whole group of diseases, which I know many of you will know very well, where children have both developmental impairment and an epileptic encephalopathy process that's superimposed on the underlying developmental problems. Now that epileptic encephalopathy process may have a remediable component and that can be simple, just as simple as choosing the right anti-epileptic drug and not using the wrong one. We're moving slowly but surely from the term developmental and epileptic encephalopathy to the 
to a gene name encephalopathy, such as the little boy you see in the video here, who has KCNQ2 developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, which is a potassium channel uh, disease. And many of these children are, have many comorbidities, such as this little boy with cerebral palsy and profound intellectual disability. And for this little guy who's four years old here, his seizures stopped when he was two, and yet you can see he still has very severe impairment. And now some years later, he has developed into a, a little boy with lennox gasto syndrome. So I just want to explore the term epileptic encephalopathy a little further and touch on the 2010 ILA classification, which described it as the epileptic activity itself contributing to cognitive and behavioural impairments beyond that expected from the underlying pathology alone. And at the background here, I have slow spike wave EEG, uh, which we all know is this, the, the signature of lennox gasto syndrome, which is one of our archetypal epileptic encephalopathies. And most of the patients we see with epileptic encephalopathies have frequent epileptic activity, they must have epileptic activity at some stage. They typically have frequent seizures and multiple seizure types. And one of the very important features is that it must cause developmental slowing or regression. So just let's pull that apart a little bit. And I like to think of an epileptic encephalopathy as a triad of seizures, epileptiform activity and impact on development. And people tend to use this phrase a lot nowadays, but sometimes the patient doesn't have all three features, in which case they don't have an epileptic encephalopathy. With the one exception being landau kleffner syndrome where 30% of patients may not have seizures. So most, by far the majority of children and adults have seizures. They often have multiple seizure types, such as tonic-clonic, focal, myoclonic, and atonic seizures. The onset of these multiple seizure types can be explosive, as is common in myoclonic atonic epilepsy, or can be gradual, as occurs in Dravet syndrome. And I'm going to return to that in some detail a bit later on. In some of these syndromes, they may have just one seizure type, such as absence seizures with eyelid myoclonias. Many of those children don't have other seizure types, although, of course, they may have uh, tonic-clonic seizures. And then landau kleffner syndrome, only 70% of the children have seizures. The second part of our triad is that of epileptiform activity, which is usually frequent. There are many distinctive patterns as we as neurologists recognize, such as slow two hertz spike wave activity that we see in lennox gasto syndrome, hypsarrhythmia, which is the signature, of course, of infantile spasm syndrome, and multifocal discharges, which are often abundant and seen in many of the epileptic encephalopathies. They may also have a time-related pattern regarding age of onset of particular patterns, such as hypsarrhythmia and infancy, and they may show evolutions, such as West syndrome going to lennox gasto syndrome, a very common pattern of evolution. But it, just to point this out, if you never have epileptiform activity, then the child cannot have an epileptic encephalopathy. That seems obvious, but still um, we see lots of patients, uh, lots of doctors are, are missing that point. The third part of a triad is the impact on development. And an epileptic encephalopathy can occur in a, in a child or an, even an adult with previously normal development or um, quite often delayed development. But then their development slows or regresses. And this can happen once with, a, say, an episode of status epilepticus. It can be stepwise, or it can just be a gradual decline. Triggers to this deterioration most commonly are seizures, but it could be infection, brain edema, vaccination, and, and there are others, of course, as well. So to look at this concept in picture form, you have a child having lots of seizures, as uh, this little girl with SCN2A encephalopathy had, abundant epileptiform activity, and she was never normal, but then she showed marked regression. So why does this whole concept of an epileptic encephalopathy matter? Well, firstly, 
it may be that there is something that we can do about it. So, for example, if the patient has a structural cause, and here I'm showing you um, an MRI of tuberous sclerosis with multiple tubers, and if, the, uh, if particular tubers can be ascertained that are epileptogenic, and you perform a resection of those epileptogenic tubers, the patient may show resolution of the epileptic encephalopathy process. Equally, we know that many of these children now have a genetic basis that we can identify. And here you see a potassium channel, and we know that in KCNQ2 development or epileptic encephalopathy, carbamazepine or phenytoin sodium channel blockers can really uh, improve the outcome. They won't normalize the child, but they certainly can get the seizures under control sooner, and that can impact on development. The other thing I wanted to point out briefly is that many of the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies are associated with movement disorders, such as the stereotypies you can see here with the dyskinetic um, hand movements in this little boy with STXBP1. You'll hear more voices in a moment, so I'll just tell you the little girl in the middle has got cerebellar features, and the little boy on the end has got a hyperkinetic movement disorder. Unfortunately, the uh, audio on the, on the video has to play because I have the audio on so you can hear me. Um, but just to highlight that many of these children have different types of movement disorders. Now, there are many different epilepsy syndromes within the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. These are the common ones, West, Lennox, Gasto, Drave, myoclonic, atonic epilepsy, but there are also a whole range of rare ones, such as Otohara syndrome. There are some that are just focal uh, epileptic encephalopathies, such as Rasmussen syndrome, uh, tuberous sclerosis, hemimegencephaly. But importantly, there are many patients that fit between these, that, that, who don't fit into a specific syndromic diagnosis. For example, in this blue area here, you have babies with early infantile developmental and epileptic encephalopathies with onset under three months, ones with infantile onset between three months and two years. And of course, a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy can occur at any age, such as the progressive myoclonus epilepsies, which often begin later in life. So just some examples for, about differentiating patients with developmental and epileptic encephalopathies from those with intellectual disability and epilepsy. So for example, in Landau-Kleffner syndrome, you have a child with normal development or isolated speech delay, and then they regress with loss of speech. They have an acquired aphasia, and they have this very classical auditory agnosia, which is where they recognize, they don't recognize common sounds, such as the doorbell ringing or the phone. 70% of these children have seizures, but those seizures are often easily brought under control. Um, and uh, they have this hallmark EEG of bilaterally synchronous continuous spike wave occupying more than 85% of sleep. Turning now to another syndrome, and we'll spend some time talking about this in a lot more detail, but Drave syndrome is classically described as a baby of six months presenting with febrile hemiclonic status. They have normal development in the first one to two years of life. They go on often to have other seizure types, including focal impaired awareness seizures, myoclonic seizures, absence seizures, and their development having been normal plateaus and regresses after about two years of age, and they usually end up with intellectual disability. And the third case I want to describe to you is the patient with a developmental encephalopathy and epilepsy, where they're effectively always delayed, they have intellectual disability, they may have epilepsy that begins at any age, but it's usually mild or could even be moderate, but their EEG is, uh, shows epileptiform activity, it's rare, and they do not show developmental regression or plateauing. So thinking about these three examples, Landau-Kleffner is our archetypal epileptic encephalopathy. Drave syndrome 
is both a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. And that is because we know that the children's development goes off um, with the SCM1A mutation, even without a lot of seizures occurring. Um, and although initially their EEGs are not very active, they do become more active with time. So it really is like the prototype of a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. And the last example I'm sharing is not an epileptic encephalopathy, it's just a child with intellectual disability and epilepsy. So let's turn to causation. And we now know of more than 300 genes that cause the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And in fact, the vast majority of them have a genetic basis. So um, you can see this figure here taken from our review back in 2016, when there were about 60 genes known at that time. Uh, and there, uh, they implicated a whole range of different cellular functions listed here. But now we know about a lot more genes that are implicated. But you know, finding the gene doesn't mean that you have the absolute answer because one gene typically has a phenotypic spectrum and that can be a self-limited epilepsy which we think of as a benign disorder but we're trying to move from the term benign to self-limited and a severe group of epilepsies such as the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. So it's not as easy as one syndrome equals one genetic disease and you have a gene causing both. And of course, if you turn to my favorite gene, SCM1A, it causes the self-limited phenotype of genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus, with most of the phenotypes being relatively mild. But it can also cause a range of developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And if we just think about SCM1A and the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, you can see here a whole range of different syndromes that are caused by SCM1A with, of course, which are, with the poster child, of course, being Dravet syndrome. But we described a few years ago, a very severe early infantile form, much more severe than Dravet. Um, it's known to be involved in the syndrome of epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures and also myoclonic atonic epilepsy. So then if one just takes a syndrome such as epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures, we conducted a large international uh, review of the genetics of this particular syndrome um, in 2019. And you can see there are now 33 different genes involved in this syndrome. And the ones in blue are all dominantly inherited. The few in green are excellent inherited. And the ones in brown are recessive. And one of the interesting points about this uh, study was that the recessive, there were more recessive genes involved than we expected, because we all tend to think about the epileptic, the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies being de novo dominant diseases, but in fact, we found quite a number of recessive diseases. And importantly, 30% remained to be solved. So you need to understand the epilepsy syndrome in the patient you're seeing to know about the genetic architecture of that particular syndrome. And in this paper, we found that 70% of the patients with the very severe syndrome of epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures are solved. In contrast to Dravet syndrome, where more than 90% are solved and most of them have a mutation of just one gene, SCN1A, the sodium channel gene that encodes the uh, pore forming subunit of the sodium channel, which you can see here embedded in the cell membrane. So why does it matter? Why should we even be interested in looking for the cause of the developmental and epileptic encephalopathy? Well, firstly, I think we cannot uh, overemphasize that it ends the diagnostic odyssey for families who are going through a very difficult time. And I like to say that if you can find the genetic uh, pathogenic variant, you've actually got the beginning of the answer. It's the answer to why the child is unwell, but it's the beginning of beginning to help the family. So uh, what else does the gene or the, the, the cause tell us? Well, it often informs uh, us about the severity of that child's likely disease. It tells us which comorbidities we should look for. 
And it also may help us understand the child's prognosis. For example, are they at high risk of SUDEP or, uh, or other comorbidities? And how will it help? Well, it helps you to optimize therapy for the child. It uh, is very important in the, um, the current drive towards precision therapies, and also can be very important to assist the family with genetic counseling. So let's think about which type of genetic testing that you should be considering in patients with developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. Well, all patients should undergo a chromosomal microarray, and this is looking for small copy number variants, including deletions, duplications, and chromosomal rearrangements. One then can move to whole exome sequencing. And just to remember that that only uh, looks at the 1% to 2% of the genome that encodes the protein. And really, this test is replacing gene panels. And in fact, some of the companies use exomes and just uh, actually analyze the specific genes of interest in a panel, in a, in a targeted panel within the exome. Remembering in an exome, we have 22,000 variants in each of us where we differ from the general population. So it's still quite... Um, quite a difficult test in that you have to figure out which of those 22,000 variants is causing the child's disease. And now the, the sort of ultimate test, if you like, is whole genome sequencing. And that involves doing the uh, um, sequencing the entire genome, 100% of a genome. And we're then able to look at the introns, which is the other 88 98% of a genome and find mutations there. But this is quite complex still uh, to find the pathogenic variant and is largely in the research domain. But it's watch this space, this is coming. The other thing I just wanted to mention is that one should always think about trios in children with developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, which means you either do trio exome or trio genome sequencing. And it's a much easier experiment, if you like, or test is probably, it's not really an experiment, because if you do the exomes of mum, dad, and child, you can look at where the child differs from the mother and father, recognizing the child will get 11,000 variants from dad and 11,000 variants from mum. And so if you're looking for a de novo uh, mutation in the child, you're looking at where that child has a change that's not present in mum or in dad. And the same can be said for whole genome sequencing. I want to then move to um, an important part of genetic testing that's becoming more important every day at the moment called mosaicism. And here I'm just beginning to talk about this by showing you a beautiful uh, Aboriginal picture uh, from an Australian Aboriginal, our in Indigenous population, where they do a lot of this painting, which is very mosaic-like with different, uh, looking like lots of different types of cells in this lizard. So mosaicism refers to where you have two populations of cells. You have uh, the normal cells and the mutant cells with the mosaic mutation, sometimes limited to one tissue, such as brain, obviously very relevant to us and very relevant to brain malformations, but also to patients with developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. But this mosaicism may also be limited to the gonads of a parent. So you can have a completely normal, healthy mosaic parent in the sperm or in the eggs, and then they, um, they, the mosaic uh, gamete goes to form a baby who then gets the mutation in every cell in the baby's body. So what can we tell you about mosaicism? Well, I think it's a cause of many developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, and we're still just learning about that. But in many of our studies, we've seen that um, just, you know, one or a few patients out of 60 might be mosaic. This is a lovely study from the Dutch group showing that of 113 patients with Drave syndrome, they did very deep sequencing of the patient's mutation with a median coverage of 12 
181, but even up to 7,000 times of the mutation. And they found that 7.5% of the probands were actually mosaic, which is interesting because as soon as the patient is mosaic, you know that it started, the mutation started in that patient and they did not inherit it, which means that genetic counselling is much better for the parents because they do not have an increased recurrence risk of having a second child with the same mutation. So that's where mosaicism is present in the patient. What about where the parents have given rise to here you see a little girl who's four and her two-year-old brother with developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. Neither can sit, neither can talk, and they're both profoundly impaired. And you see the little boy has got a, a very severe movement disorder. Now, really, by the time the families had two affected children, it's obvious that they have a genetic disease. And in this case, we found that the father had a very low level of mosaicism of Dynamin 1 in his sperm. We, we didn't look at his sperm, we looked at his blood and he was 6% mosaic for, for this mutation in blood. So this is really every family's worst nightmare, having two affected children. In our study of 120 families where the children were thought to have de novo mutations, we found that 8% of the patients had a parent who was at mosaic, and those families are at markedly increased risk of having a second affected child. Now, one of the clues we found was that if the parents had had any seizures, even febrile seizures, they were more likely to be mosaic. And also that the parents' uh, epilepsy or seizures correlated with the proportion of mosaicism they had. So if the, the father that we picked up with 28% mosaicism for SCM1A actually has epilepsy, he's now about 45, and I look after him and he has a a sort of a mild to moderate epilepsy. But many of the other parents with 12% mosaicism only had febrile seizures. So the severity of the epilepsy correlates with their percentage mosaicism. I wanted just to turn for a moment to epidemiology of these um, severe epilepsies. This is from one of my PhD students who studied severe epilepsies beginning under 18 months of age defined as having frequent seizures and epileptiform EEG and having failed at least two anti-epileptic drugs. She uh, found 114 infants over three years in our state of Victoria, which is a population of about five, five to six million. And she performed a very comprehensive analysis looking for the etiology in each child. One of the important findings from her study is that we ended up with a figure of one in 2,000 infants have these severe infantile onset epilepsies. Because of the structure of the study, this did not include Dravet syndrome or children with onset after 18 months. So I tend to think this group has probably got double this uh, incidence. So what did she find? Well, she showed um, that 50% she was able to find the the genetic cause of the patient's epilepsy, and a further 27% had malformations, of course, some of these being genetic as well. So when you look very hard, you actually, she could find an etiology overall in 67% of the patients, which is, is very exciting that we can get to the bottom of such a high proportion of patients. There was also a, an elegant epidemiological study from Samir Zuberi's group in Scotland, and they looked at all children with seizures, so not just severe epilepsies, under 36 months of age. Um, and they ended up with one in 2,000 births for all epilepsies. Um, and of that, 79 of their 343 affected children had a developmental epileptic encephalopathy, and they were able to look at the frequency of specific genes, such as SCM1A, which was more than just DEEs, also included mild self-limited epilepsies, but PCDH19, SLC2A1, which is glucose transport of one deficiency syndrome, CDKL5. So at last giving us a handle on the frequency of some of these diseases.
And here are the genes from their study, which remember were all epilepsies. And you can see interestingly that the most frequent gene they picked up was PRRT2, which is the gene for uh, self-limited uh, familial infantile seizures, though it's not always uh, familial. SCM1A came in second, followed by KCNQ2, SLC2A1, GLUT1 deficiency, CDKL5, PCDH19, SCLC6A1. So just gives you a bit of a feeling for the frequency from an epidemiological perspective. And this was the groups that they found uh, were more likely to yield a genetic diagnosis. Children or babies presenting with afebrile seizures under six months or a febrile focal seizures under 12 months. And here you can see the genes that they found. So I wanted to spend some time now sharing some new clinical research with you. But by way of background, um, I'm going to just walk us through what Dravé syndrome means. And this is really about the, the research is around the limits of Dravé syndrome and what should we include in the definition of a syndrome. It's really by way of example, because I think there are many different uh, syndromes where we need to look at the evidence that's published to understand really the full spectrum. And this is incredibly important when you're thinking about precision medicine trials. All right, so um, Dravé syndrome is, we're always taught, and this is what I have taught for many years, begins in a previously well developmentally normal baby of six months who presents with febrile or generalized status, febrile, febrile hemiclonic or generalized status epilepticus. Um, and between six and 12 months, they may have fairly frequent episodes of status epilepticus. Between one and five years, they go on to develop other seizure types, such as focal, myoclonic, absence, and non-convulsive status. And here you see a little 21-monther who's having some photic stimulation. And you can see the photic stimulation in this little boy triggers a cluster of myoclonic seizures. And um, we know about 15% of Dravé children are photosensitive. In Dravé syndrome, the developmental course, as I said before, the child normally has normal development. They walk a little late at 16 to 18 months. We found in our study of Dravé gait. Their language is slow, and then they regress when they have uh, prolonged seizures. They usually have intellectual disability with about 50% being severe, 30% moderate, and 20% mild. Their examination finds a normal examination in a young baby, but then they become ataxic, initially with a physiological ataxia, but as they grow older, their pyramidal signs may become more obvious and they develop this unusual crouch gait that we delineated um, back in 2008, and that limits their long distance walking. EEG is normal in the first couple of years of life, but then they get frequent irregular generalized spike wave and multifocal discharges. And finally, the genes, and we know that most of the patients have a mutation in the SCM1A gene encoding the alpha-1 subunit of a sodium channel, about 40% uh, truncation mutations shown in red, 40% missense mutations. The vast majority are de novo, um, and some can be inherited from parents who have genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus. And we generally use the figure 80% of Dravé children have SCM1A mutations, but I'm going to share our research with you a little bit more later. So all of these uh, features together is really the uh, puzzle that we consider or that you need to think about when you're diagnosing a baby with or a child with Dravé syndrome. But what I want to ask now is, is this correct? Is what we're telling people actually right? 
So I wanted to share this new research with you where we're delineating the fuzzy edges of Dravet syndrome. And this has been performed by Dr. Wan Hui Li from Shanghai in China, a pediatric neurologist who came to work with us for a year. And from my uh, chief clinical research uh, scientist, Amy Schneider. And you could say, well, why do these fuzzy edges matter? Why, why am I worried about this? Well, firstly, if someone doesn't fit that exact puzzle I've just delineated, people miss the diagnosis. That may mean that they give the wrong drug and you get seizure exacerbation, and that in turn will affect the child's development and they may have a poorer outcome. Earlier recognition is important because you can change them to the right anti-seizure medicines, you can improve their cognition that way, you can be aware of issues such as their SUDEP risk and other comorbidities. And right now is a pivotal time because a number of precision medicine trials are emerging and we can make sure those patients are available to start these exciting gene therapy trials. So what happens if we get it wrong? And I just wanted to share this seizure diary with you, which is only from 2018 of a child who was being looked after by a very competent pediatric neurologist. But you can see here the seizures are in red. The first seizure occurred at four months of age, seven hours after immunization, with a temperature of 38.6 degrees Celsius. And then the baby goes on to have several other bilateral tonic-clonic seizures uh, for um, this first one lasted 20 minutes and then there was steering to the left for another 25 minutes. The neurologist started Kepra, uh, but the seizures kept going and uh, they really didn't do that much. So at this point, the um, neurologist changed the patient over to oxcarbazepine, trileptal, and look what it did. A sodium channel blocker made the child much worse. And this is all because the neurologist did not recognize that this was Dravet syndrome. So in our fuzzy edges study, we've looked at 188 patients with SCM1A mutations and their median age at study was 18 years, but you can see they ranged from one to 61 years. And here you see their mutations as the literature has repeatedly shown by ours and many other groups, about 40% of missense, 40% of truncation, and the rest are other types of mutations. So let's start with age of onset. I said to you the median was six months. Some of my uh, colleagues say it doesn't begin after 12 months. So is this actually right? And you can see here a lovely curve delineating the age of onset in our cohort with a median overall of 5.74 months. Now, if we think about um, this cutoff of 12 months, uh, there are several in our cohort that you can see that started after 12 months that would not have been included in a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome if we have very rigid limitations. Um, and these two are nasty uh, mutations. They're both truncation mutations. Um, and this one is a missense mutation. But we're not the only ones to observe this. And looking at the literature, there are many other cases shown here with the stars that have got onset after 12 months of age. The other important point is that our oldest one is actually mosaic for the mutation, 22% mosaic. And you say, well, it's only mosaic, she's only mosaic, so therefore maybe she's got milder disease. But we looked at that and we had another one who was mosaic and the disease didn't look any milder. And um, in the Delanger paper that I mentioned before, they're all mosaic and you can see their onset ages were not necessarily later. So our median is 5.75 a month um, and our oldest is 20 months. And this is what we've been teaching people about the seizure types for this disease. So what were the actual seizure types at onset? You can see here that hemiclonic, which is what we think of with Dravet syndrome, only accounted for a third of those presenting. By far the most common were bilateral tonic-clonic seizures, but there were a range of other seizure types, including some children presenting with myoclonic seizures, and Dravet herself described that originally, um, and also combined seizure types. So what about fever? We always say that Dravet children present with a febrile 
seizure. Is that true? Well, actually, it's not. We found that almost half presented with an afebrile seizure at onset, looking at the hospital records. And what about fever moving forward? Well, I think one of the take-home messages is that they often seize at a lowish fever, 38.2, which I think is very drave. And when you hear that, should make you think about it. And interestingly, in our cohort, looking through their whole trajectory, 3% of or 6 of our patients never had seizures with fever. What about the duration of the first seizure? Well, um, we tend to think of it as being status, but is this correct? No, it's not. About a third present with status, but many present with shorter seizures. And you can see uh, that there are even 29% that present with a, a seizure less than five minutes. And if we look at those, some of them are just the sort of typical length of seizures you see in children with their first tonic-clonic seizure. What about the duration between their, each child's first five seizures? Well, we tend to think, well, it happens within a month or two that they'll have the next seizure. And that's often the correct with a median of 29 days. But this is important. Out here, we have patients with more than 200 days between their first and second seizure. Even the second to third seizure can be more than 150 days out. But then the, uh, the band gets tighter as you go from the fourth, third to fourth and fourth to fifth seizure. Turning now to, we've got their first seizure type. What about their second seizure type? When does it happen? Well, we can see the first seizure type in Dravé syndrome begins from six weeks or it may begin up to 20 months. We've talked about that. Um, what about the second? We often talk about the other seizure types beginning after 12 months. Well, that's actually not right. The median for the second seizure type is nine months, with the youngest age being two and a half months. And look, the oldest is after is at 10 years. And the third seizure type begins at a median of 16 months, but again, can be way down here at four months or can be at six years. Now, what about the types of seizures? You can see here the types of seizures are what you'd expect, really. Uh, but you can also have tonic and atonic seizures, which is not well recognised. Um, and convulsive status epilepticus at some time occurs in 91% of patients and non-convulsive status in 30%. And fever sensitivity I've already touched on. So what about developmental slowing? We tend to say the children are normal in the first year of life, but that's actually not true either. About a quarter um, actually have abnormal development before one year of life. Um, and some of them don't show developmental slowing until considerably later. So what has our evidence-based study told us about the definitions of Dravé syndrome? Well, it's making us have to rewrite it, really, because we know that developmental delay exists before 12 months in, in over 20%, that onset goes from one and a half to 20 months, that 54% um, percent present with uh, tonic-clonic seizures rather than hemiclonic, they're afebrile in 46%. They can be brief rather than status epilepticus. Other seizure types begin after before 12 months. Um, about a third never have a hemiclonic seizure. 9% uh, never have status. 3% never have fever sensitivity. And tonic and atonic seizures are not as rare as we thought and occur in more than 20% of patients. Just turning for a moment to the mortality of Dravet syndrome, you can see here, this is the ages in which we have had patients die, which is extremely sad, but you can see SUDEP is the large majority, but some of them have status epilepticus with cerebral edema um, and some have accidental causes. And what about the fact that we talk about only 80% of patients with Dravé syndrome being solved. When we looked at our cohort, that wasn't true. Uh, when we looked at, uh, at the cohort overall, we have solved uh, more than 90%. Um, and 93% of the definite group had SCM1A with a few other genes and 92% of the probable group. So here is our new Dravé puzzle with all the points I've already made uh, spelt out so that you can actually see 
uh, how we've changed our thinking about the definition of Dravet syndrome. So turning to the big picture, we have with patients with developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, we have an urgent clinical need. We can now solve at least 50% of these children. And that if you can find the gene that's causing their problem often gives very useful insights into the disease mechanism. It allows our science colleagues to model the disease to then develop novel or repurposed therapeutics. And then we need to try and see if they work in our patients and if they do, figure out how to implement them. And this at the end of the day will lead to improved patient outcomes, which is what we most want. So in conclusion, 50% uh, are solved. We need to think about the approach I've shown you to looking at the DRAVE data to develop evidence-based syndrome definitions. We have to be very aware of reproductive counselling risks for our families because of the risk of parental mosaicism and also patient mosaicism. We are in the very exciting place where we're getting ready for precision medicines and we need rigorous controlled trials of new therapeutics. There's a lot of hope, but we have to make sure that these new drugs really work. So I'd like to conclude by thanking the fantastic group that I work with in Australia. We have an annual epilepsy research retreat. Last year it was online. Hopefully this year it will not have to be. But also, most importantly, I'd like to thank families and patients for working with us in our research and my many collaborators around the world. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ingrid, for your excellent presentation and uh, detailed information. Uh, I'm going to start by asking a question that we've received. Uh, it says, what do you think about trinucleotide expansion as a cause of DEE, especially in combination with movement disorders? Yes, look, I think it's a, a very exciting field, the repeat expansion world. And uh, we know that it's very important for disorders such as Huntington's disease uh, and many of those children with Huntington's disease actually get progressive myoclonus epilepsies. So I guess the answer is that we know that is likely. Um, last year we published, or was it 2019, I can't remember, um, the repeat expansions that cause fame in the European families, which is the familial adult myoclonic epilepsy. That is actually not um, a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy that is a, a genetic generalized epilepsy really but uh, so we know it's already the repeat expansions are very relevant to the epilepsies but at the moment we don't know about repeat expansions causing too too many of the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies but i think that will happen i think you're right and uh, our next question about whether metabolic genetic causes such as GLUT1 deficiencies could be considered as epileptic encephalopathies? Great question. Thank you very much. And one that's very close to my heart uh, because I've done a lot of work on the epileptology of GLUT1 deficiency. And um, I've got a figure which I can't show you at the moment, but um, basically I think GLUT1 encephalopathy originally described by Daryl DeVivo is a perfect example of a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. And I have several patients with that who are intellectually disabled and have severe, often myoclonic and absence epilepsy. But in our work on delineating the epileptology of, of GLUT1 deficiency, we've shown in fact, there are many different epilepsies that are not associated with intellectual disability that cause are caused by GLUT1. So that includes uh, idiopathic generalized epilepsies and focal epilepsies. It also causes myoclonic epilepsy, which is an epileptic encephalopathy. So GLUT1 deficiency is interesting because it has a spectrum of self-limited epilepsies and severe epilepsies, as it also has a spectrum of movement disorders. And do you recommend whole genome sequencing in each suspected epileptic encephalopathy? 
Yes, in an ideal world I would, but most places can't afford it and whole genome sequencing is difficult to interpret at the moment. Um, so we do it at a research level when we can find funding to do it, but it's expensive. I think one day that will be the normal thing, but right now whole exome sequencing is, is what's in the clinic. If you Even that, we have to sort of negotiate for funding for each child. Uh, but one day I'm sure whole genome sequencing will be in the clinic. And what is your recommendation genetic uh, study for ESES? Thanks for that question. An uh, interesting one. So I recommend, uh, no, I, sorry, I, I regard ESES or continuous spike wave uh, in slow wave sleep as part of the epilepsy aphasia spectrum where you have Landau Kleffner syndrome, epileptic encephalopathy with CSWS, and a number of patients along the way, atypical benign focal epilepsy of childhood, for example. Um, and we know that GRIN 2A, um, and in fact, I've got one case of GRIN 2B that uh, accounts for somewhere between 10 and 20% of those patients. So you absolutely should, and there are some other genes like SYNC-SR2, there are a few other genes as well, but GRIN2A is the big one. And you should definitely be thinking about doing genetic testing in those children. And interestingly, we've done a lovely study with my speech pathology colleagues, Turner and Morgan, um, where we've shown that the GRIN2A children and their parents, if they've got inherited mutations, have got a very interesting speech pattern, which is a bit like this. And so if you've got a parent that speaks like this, you should think Grin 2A. And our next question is from Dr. Busanka. Uh, she's asking, do you believe that uh, fenthoramine will solve the Dravet issue? Oh, look, I wish, I wish. I think it's a fantastic drug and I think it is like a what we call a magic bullet. It's the best drug I've seen for any of these diseases, but um, the children's still not normal. And at the end of the day, that's what you and I want. We want to have a baby that turns into a normal functioning adult with no epilepsy and no comorbidities. So whilst I think fanfluramine is fantastic, I'm hoping the gene therapy will take us to what we really want, that final solution of, of a normal child. And are there any specific drugs for myoclonic atonic seizures? Well, in the syndrome of myoclonic atonic epilepsy, we need to think very early about the ketogenic diet. Uh, and it's the one place where, you know, I will think about the diet as my first or second mine, usually my second mine after some Valparaiso or some Clobazam. Um, and uh, that's some of those. We showed that 5% of patients with myoclonic atonic epilepsy have GLUT1 deficiency. So some of them need the diet because of that. But that's certainly not all of them. And I think that you don't need to know the gene to try the diet. I think it's definitely should be high on your list for myoclonic atonic epilepsy. There are a whole range of other drugs that I would walk through though. Um, if, you know, the benzodiazepines, the valproate, lamotrigine, levetiracetam, topiramate. I think topiramate often is a very effective drug in many of the generalized developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And our last question is uh, about consanguinity. It says that in uh, many of the countries in our region, they have a mm -hmm. high rate of consanguinities in the whole population. So do we have to consider mosaism or consider autosomal recessive uh, disease? I think that's a very important question. So thank you for that. Um, and I'm sure like um, everyone in the region, as soon as we have a lot of Arabic people in Australia now, and as soon as I hear an Arabic name, I first thing I say is, are you related? Are you consanguineous? Because immediately I start thinking, could it be recessive? So I think it's really important. And one of that's one of the reasons that I pointed out, particularly the recessive patients in the epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures study, because we found more recessive cases there than we expected. And there were a lot of out, outbred families as well. So then they're often, often compound heterozygotes, but you've got to think about recessive or you miss it. On the other hand though, the point that's worth making 
is just because there is consanguinity doesn't mean the child can't have a de novo dominant mutation or be mosaic. So you have to think every way, which is what we do in medicine, isn't it? You've got to think about all the possibilities. Okay, apparently there's another question. <laughs> so what is your recommendation for treatment of adolescents with uh, LGS with normal IQ, normal MRI and failed on uh, ketogenic diet, 5 ASM? Look, you know, I just keep trying. That's the first thing to say. The second thing is I, I have a lot of patients with LGS and a third of my practice is now adult. And, and so I have a lot of adults with developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And um, I think you just need to keep trying different things. So you've done the ketogenic diet, but you know, have you done um, the newer drugs, uh, particularly parampinol? Uh, we're involved in a trial of parampinol in LGS, and I've tried it in a few people out of the trial, and I've been quite impressed with it. Lecosamide is certainly worth thinking about. They've done a trial of fenfluramine, and I think the results are promising, but I haven't, I'm not 100% sure, but I've got five adults with LGS, and some of them have benefited. One's got a CHD2 mutation and she's done really well with fenfluramine. Um, so I think you have to think broadly around them. I'm not too keen on carbamazepine, LGS, or, um, but I think, or oxcarbazepine, but I think there are many very good drugs that you should try in LGS. And uh, we're reaching to the end of the hour, but we still have time for more questions, especially short ones. Do you recommend the use of uh, THC or CBB and seizure treatment? Look, I certainly do recommend C CBD, but not THC. And, you know, one of the things when you've had quite a few years experience and you've followed your patients over many years is I've now had two of my normal adolescent boys with one with frontal lobe, I think both with frontal lobe epilepsy, and they both started smoking weed, which is cannabis, of course, that's Australian for, I don't know if that, that term's used um, in the Middle East. And they both developed psychosis, courtesy of THC, and they now are a shadow of themselves and they'll never be normal again. Um, and that it's not because of their epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, they both had frontal lobe epilepsy, but they were both normal, delightful. I remember them as school kids and they were great. And now the, the THC has ruined their lives with psychosis. They can't finish university degrees. They can't get employment. So I'm very cautious, in, in fact, terrified of giving THC to patients with severe epilepsy. And the other little bit of that story is that I've also got some patients with lennox gastro syndrome, one with a progressive myoclonus epilepsy, where the, nothing to do with CBD, but they just developed psychosis between the age of 15 and 25 years of age, exactly as one does the ages one does develop schizophrenia. And it was really awful to see the impact on families. And these families were experts at severe epilepsy, but suddenly their child or their adolescent was becoming psychotic. So I say that to point out that I think some of these brains are prone to psychosis. So the last thing you want to do is give anything else that could make them psychotic. Thank you so much, Professor Ingrid. And we really appreciate your taking the time late in the day for you. And it's midnight. On behalf of, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and on behalf of everybody here, thank you so much. We look forward to meet you in person. And yes, uh, now we... Thanks very much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Nice. Uh, so now we'll go to uh, Professor Triki, who is going to present our next uh, speaker. Thank you, Abdelaziz, and thank you, Professor Schiffer, for this uh, very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, very nice. Uh, and uh, it is now my pleasure to um, introduce uh, uh, our next uh, second uh, speaker. It's uh, Raida al Berede, our friend, Raida al Berede from Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, Raida is a consultant pediatric, pediatric neurologist and uh, director of uh, Neuroscience Center and Comprehensive Epilepsy Program 
It is a chairwoman of a pediatric neurology department in King Fahd Speciality Hospital in the MEM. And uh, she was uh, the, uh, the previous uh, president of Saudi uh, League Again Epilepsy. So you have the floor, uh, Raida. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank my respected colleague in the International League Against Epilepsy, Eastern Mediterranean's English language webinar for the kind invitation. It's really my pleasure to talk to you all today about anti-epileptic drugs during neonatal period and infancy. I would like to thank Professor Ingrid for her wonderful presentation. It's always a challenge to talk after her. I will do my best. This is an overview of neonatal seizure that I am going to talk to you today. Neonatal seizures affect one to five full-term neonate per thousand life birth. There are the most common neonatal neurological emergencies. EEG is an essential in the diagnosis. Phenobarbitone remains the first line drug for treatment of neonatal seizure despite having only 50% of its efficacy. And to date, there is little consensus about the best second line treatment for neonatal seizure and there are considerable off-label use of antiepileptic drugs with sparse efficacy yet in the neonatal period. If we want to talk about etiology of neonatal seizure, seizure are the hallmark of neurological injury caused by hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in approximately 60% of all new neonatal seizures, 7 to 20% perinatal arterial ischemic stroke, 7 to 18% in intracranial hemorrhage, 3 to 17% congenital cerebral malformation, and the other etiologies such as infection, metabolic causes, and electrolyte imbalance. There is no antiepileptic drug protocol used based on the etiology and administration of antiepileptic drug according to hospital protocol. Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is the third most common cause of neonatal mor mortality. Approximately 9% of all deaths and 21% of term deaths. Globally, it's estimated to cause 1 million neonatal deaths each year. It has significant secondary morbidity, 29% cerebral palsy, 45% cognitive delay, and 12% seizure disorder, 9% sensory neural hearing loss, and 26% visual. It's always important to know the pathophysiological aspect of neonatal seizure as immature brain is susceptible to seizure due to early development of excitatory neurotransmitter and delay inhibitory function of GABA and excess of excitatory glutamergic neuron. Binding of GABA agonist modulators to GABA A receptor triggers either influx or efflux of chloride ion, depend on the neuronal equilibrium potential for chloride. Expression of inward sodium potassium chloride co-transport in human cortex is increased at birth compared to one year of age, and expression of outward sodium potassium co-transport increase from birth onward. And this will lead to accumulation of intracellular chloride in immature neuron through sodium potassium chloride co-transport. Thus, the equilibrium potential for chloride become positive in relation to the resting membrane potential. 
to explain why treatment of neonatal seizure with GABA-A agonists such as phenobarbitone or benzodiazepine may be suboptimal, this is because neonatal ischemia increases sodium potassium chloride co-transporter and decreases sodium chlo uh, uh, chloride co-transporter expression, whereas hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy injury increases sodium potassium chloride transporter alone. In addition, GABA-A receptors are expressed at low level in human and rodent cortex and contain less alpha-1 subunit than either adult counterparts, and this will lead to decrease their sensitivity to modulating benzodiazepine. The increased seizure susceptibility due to development Peculiarities of immature brain and excitatory GABA function might suggest that a class of antiepileptic drugs other than GABA modulators should be considered as first-line treatment for neonatal seizures. How can we diagnose neonatal seizure? Diagnosis of neonatal seizure is really difficult. The subtle clinical seizure presentation neonate and the phenomena of electroclinical uncoupling make the diagnosis of neonatal seizure challenging. Both phenobarbitone and phenytoin produce equal rate of uncoupling, 58% of neonate exhibiting only electrographic evidence of seizure after drug administration. Amplitude integrated EEG is very helpful. It uses few channels than traditional EEG and requires less expertise for interpretation. It's used in the nursery ICU and some seizure might be missed because neonatal seizure can be short, low amplitude, infrequent, and it may also have artifacts which may lead to false positive readings. A considerable effort in recent years to develop an automated neonatal seizure detection system to aid in clinical decision support in the nursery ICU. A continuous EEG monitoring considered to be a gold standard tool for diagnosis and follow-up of treatment of neonatal seizure. Its rule extends to the di differential diagnosis of seizure etiology such as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, stroke, epileptic encephalopathy, congenital metabolic disease. Multi-channel continuous EEG monitoring of new needs at a risk of seizure should be implemented rapidly to confirm the diagnosis and optimize the outcome. In addition, we are in need to have laboratory testing, magnetic resonance, MRI, to determine the underlying pathology of neonatal seizure. I will focus in detail about treatment strategies of neonatal seizure. Once neonatal seizures are suspected, a treatable underlying cause such as hypoglycemia, electrolyte disturbances should be considered and should be uh, treated uh, immediately. Antiepileptic drugs are administered only if neonatal seizure is confirmed and according to the clinical preference, independent of the seizure etiology. We always talk about neuroprotective strategies such as hypothermia, which are initiated during latent period of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and this might interact with antiepileptic drugs. Neonatal seizures are real neurological emergencies that must be treated promptly to prevent any exer exacerbation of neuronal injury and morbidity. Unfortunately, the current antiepileptic drugs for neonates are considered suboptimal in terms of effectiveness, safety, and long-term outcome. And the there is no rule to start antiepileptic drug following hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy 
without seizure confirmation since it has minimal benefit of survival improvement or neurodevelopmental outcome. It's very important for us to know the mechanism of action of various antiepileptic drugs used in neonatal period that work through various mechanisms of action to reduce excitability in the brain and suppress the... If we look at this slide, mode of action of neonatal antiepileptic drugs, Many drugs act by reducing excitatory neurotransmitter, glutaminergic synapse, phenytoin, topiramate lidocaine, prevent depolarization by inhibiting voltage-gated sodium channel. On the other hand, Kipra prevent calcium influx through in-type calcium channel, which in turn reduces excitosis and reduces release of glutamate from intracellular vesicles by modulating synaptic vesicles protein 2A, SV2A. In the postsynaptic terminal, phenobarb and tubiramate reduces excitatory neurotransmitter via AMBA kinate glutamate receptors. On the other hand, phenobarb Benzodiazepine and tubiramate work by enhancing inhibitory neurotransmission via GABA-A1 receptors, GABAergic synapse, and bometanide can alter action of GABAergic agent by preventing intracellular accumulation of chloride through sodium-potassium uh, chloride co-transporter. In terms of antiepileptic drugs efficacy, safety, and tolerability, we know that phenobarbitone, phenytoin, metazolam, lorazepam, clonazepam, and lidocaine are the most frequently used antiepileptic drugs in term and preterm babies. And the most current recommendations suggest initiating anticonvulsant therapy in neonate with phenobarbitone, adding either benzodiazepine, phenytoin, or lidocaine as second line agent if seizure continue. In a treatment protocol designed by Slaughter, a similar treatment regimen is proposed starting with phenobarbitone, followed by levetiracetam, phenytoin, or lidocaine, and finally, the addition of benzodiazepine as third-line agent. In other studies, if seizure were not controlled with phenobarbitone or phenytoin, midazolam, clonazepam, lidocaine, kipra, tubiramate have been used. In a survey of clinicians in USA found that approximately 73% would use Kipra and Tubiramate despite limited knowledge about pharmacokinetic of these drugs in newborn. If we talk about Tubiramate, it was shown to exacerbate cell apoptosis caused by phenytoin in rat pups despite the absence of neurodegenerative properties when administered as monotherapy. So certain antiepileptic drug combination may be detrimental to neurodevelopment. While the use of other antiepileptic drugs such as tigritol, baraldehyde, sodium valborate, vegapatrin, and lomotrigine in the treatment of neonatal seizures has been described only in reported cases. So we don't know much about this medication. In animal studies have shown a beneficial anti-seizure effect of potassium channel opener such as flobertin in the hypoxic model of neonatal seizures. During my rest of talk, I'll focus on antiepileptic drugs that have been recommended in the neonatal seizure treatment protocol that have been studied in the conjunction with EEG monitoring. And uh, would like to uh, define what we mean with antiepileptic drugs efficacy it is defined as cessation of seizure or 80% redu seizure reduction. In one study, they mentioned 50% seizure reduc reduction. However, we are in the need of further workup to define antiepileptic drug efficacy using EEG criteria. Let us start with phenobarbitone and phenytoin. As we know, phenobarbitone remains the first choice of antiepileptic drugs in the neonatal seizure due to its extensive history of its use in, the, in this population. As we know, it acts 
by increasing GABA-A mediator inhibitors. New need with persistent seizures are have more severe brain damage and half of the babies on two antiepileptic drugs or more reported to have poor outcome. Phenytoin, on the other hand, reduces excitatory neurotransmitter by blocking voltage-gated sodium channel. It's often administered as second line to phenobarbitone. And combination treatment with phenobarb and phenytoin seizure re uh, remained in up to 50% of babies as confirmed by continuous EEG. Lidocaine, it works by inhibiting voltage-gated sodium channel. It's administered either second line or third line with efficacy rate as high as 78% based on continuous EEG monitoring assessment. Lidocaine as second or third line antiepileptic drug had a good seizure control for at least of two to four hour antiepileptic drugs effect in 71% of new need, both terms and preterm. An earlier study demonstrate the lower efficacy rate of 60% with lidocaine supported by continuous monitoring, we need to observe very closely the adverse effect of lidocaine, which include bradycardia and ventricular tachycardia. As with many antiepileptic drugs, a tailored neonatal dosage regimen is needed, as cardiotoxicity level were found in the majority of neonates treated with standard lidocaine infusion. And based on that, the dosing uh, was uh, recommended to be 50% uh, less than the recommended dose. For example, if baby is one kilo, he should receive 52 milligram as opposed to 110 milligram. So lidocaine demonstrated a good safety profile in new Benzodiazepine have had varied success as second and third line agent in the treatment of neonatal seizures. They allosterically modulate the chloride channel in the GABA-A receptors to increase inhibition, inhibitory neurotransmitters. Midazolam response rate vary from 0 to 100% using continuous EEG monitoring, efficacy of 50% when it is used as second line antiepileptic drug, and 73 to 100% as third line antiepileptic drug. It appeared to be less effective than lidocaine at treating persistent seizure, particularly those caused by the most severe form of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. The evidence for the effect of other benzodiazepines used in neonatal seizure is this convincing. For example, Clonazepam did not abolish any seizure as second-line antiepileptic drug in three new needs monitored by continuous EEG monitoring. The support for lorazepam as an antiepileptic drug is sparse, with less than half of the studies new needs monitored by continuous EEG monitor. Seizure control rates were as high as 86 to 100 percent in two studies unreliable because of lack of continuous EEG monitoring. Levetiracetam is a relatively new antiepileptic drug. It acts through synaptic vesicle glycoprotein 2A, SV2A, which is a protein thought to be involved in the release of neurotransmitters. It is efficacious in treating various seizures in both adults and children. It has a very favorable pharmacokinetic and safety profile in new needs, and that's why it was one of the promising antiepileptic drugs that we're thinking to use in neonatal period to prevent any side effects, especially as we know phenobarbitone, which is used as first-line agent, has many side effects. Levetiracetam, according to continuous EEG finding, it showed only 35 to 64% efficacy within 24 hours, rising to improvement in 52 to 100% of patients in 72 hours.
it is initiated as second or third line anti-epileptic drug in majority of reported cases currently. And there are many trials has been done in US, France, and China, looking at safety, efficacy, and pharmacokinetic profile of bevatricitam in neonates. It's shown to have promising anti-epileptic properties for management of neonatal seizures with better efficacy and less or no side effect. But we are still in a need of randomized control trial to assess role of levetiracetam in acute management of neonatal seizure, its neuroprotective and neurodevelopmental outcome in these neonates. What about tubiramate? Tubiramate reduces the frequency of action potential firing by altering GABA neurotransmission, block voltage gated sodium channel, and weakly block AMBA glutamate receptors, and also it is carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Similar to levetiracetam, the pharmacokinetic and safety profile are favorable, but little is known about safety, efficacy, or pharmacokinetic in the critically ill newborn population. It is considered to be effective add-on agent in neonatal seizures in four out of six neonates with no major safety concern were highlighted. However, this was uh, 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 lacking EEG monitoring and so we cannot depend on this. What about potential adjunct anti-epileptic medication, bometanide, it is a potential adjunct to antiepileptic treatment for neonatal seizure. It was originally developed as a loop diuretic, which reduced edema by inhibiting the reabsorption of sodium potassium chloride through sodium potassium chloride co-transporter in the thick ascending loop of Henley in the kidney. A number of years ago, Bometanide was observed to have antiepileptic effect in kinate acid induced seizure infection. It has an ability to block ion co-transporters in neuron and glia in the central nervous system, which in turn affect GABA signaling. Also, it blocks sodium potassium chloride co-transporter which both move chloride into the cell. By preventing intracellular chloride built up, pomotinide is thought to decrease or reverse the excitatory action of GABA, thus preventing a potentially useful combination therapy with GABAergic. There are gaps in our knowledge of this potential adjunct to antiepileptic drug for treatment of neonatal seizure, in terms of the dose at which it acts in the brain and the human blood-brain barrier permeability and transport of pimotinide and its effect on development of the central nervous system. There are two clinical tri trials were initiated to establish safety efficacy in treating neonatal seizures in Europe. In Europe, the dosing fi uh, uh, finding clinical studies particularly were treated with four doses of pomotinide, 0.05 to 0.3 mg per kilo, each given 12 hours apart, with the first dose given in conjunction with phenobarb. The trial was conducted early as the benefit, the risk ratio was no longer favorable, and the efficacy endpoint were not achieved in any of the uh, trial participated. Many recent ongoing studies are examining novel way to enhance brain level of bonotonide in the effect to overcome the pharmacokinetic issue hindering its therapeutic success. There are variety of physiological differences between neonate and adult. The, this variation in physiological effect, all pharmacokinetic process in neonate, including absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination, and this will help us to understand physiological differences between neonate and adult uh, pharmacokinetic properties of the anti-epileptic drugs. 
A key pharmacokinetic parameters including volume of distribution, fraction unbound plasma, clearance, elimination half-life are the difference in neonatal compared to adult. Moreover, these wide variability in these pharmacokinetic parameters within the neonatal population as can be seen by the range of reported. Now we will talk about the combination therapeutic strategies and adjunct therapy therapies in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy with potential for interaction with anti-epileptic hypothermia. As we know, hypothermia has demonstrated neuroprotective properties in unit with moderate to severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy with approximately 25% reduction in death and disability. It has significantly reduced seizure burden as measured by continuous EEG monitoring in unit with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and this seizure burden during hypothermia is characterized by a more even distribution over time and de novo seizure may occur after rewarming. That's why we need to be very careful in monitoring these babies during the period of What are the emerging neuroprotective treatment in neonatal seizures? Other new neuroprotective strategies that are emerging including xenon, erythropoietin, melatonin, alipronol, and sepulurin. There is no report of combination treatment with antiepileptic drug and emerging neuroprotective drugs. So combination of these novel neuroprotective agent, hypothermia, and antiepileptic drugs are a definite possibility in the future, and it needs many further studies and evaluation. Xenon protects the brain from excitatory injury by antagonizing NMDA glutamate receptor, reducing total neurotransmission. Erythropoietin, on the other hand, has anti-inflammatory properties and is also anti -obiptotic. It reduces determinant neurodevelopmental outcome in neonates with moderate to severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Melatonin reduces oxidative stress through a variety of mechanisms such as scavenging oxygen-free radicals. It augments neural protection by hypothermia in a piglet model of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Sevoflurin reduces the hippocampal apoptosis in rat model of intrauterine perinatal asphyxia and may be neuroprotective. And alivronol was found to have antioxidant properties. So all of these agents kind of promising as neuroprotective treat, uh, emerging treatment for new what about use of sedations? Ivomorphine has been used as sedative during hypothermia to reduce pain and stress, and it allows the patient to tolerate hypothermia. As hypothermia without sedation lack neuroprotective properties. In a few cases of term and preterm neonate without brain injury, morphine infusion found to be associated with increased epileptiform activity on the e continuous EEG monitoring, so we have to be very careful. And little is known about drug-drug interaction with anti-epileptic drug, but it is advised that barbiturates such as phenobarbitone may increase the sedation effect of opioids, so combination of opioid and phenobarbitone can cause more. If we want to talk about anti-epileptics and hypothermia in combination, it was found that a synergistic therapy including traditional anti-epileptic drug and hypothermia may augment neuroprotective properties of either treatment given alone. And caution need to be exercised as hypothermia may alter pharmacokinetic anti-epileptic drugs in neonate by decreased absorption, distribution, or metabolism clearance. So it may affect the uh, uh, drug level either it become toxic or less efficacious based on its uh, 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 pharmacokinetic property. Combination of therapeutic hypothermia and multi-organ 
impairment, as in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, may have additive detrimental effect on fundamental pharmacokinetic process. So we have to be very careful in combining uh, hypothermia with anti-epileptic drugs and in patients who had multi-organ failure. The rewarming phase is crucial following hypothermia is another period of pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uncertainty and it may lead to serious toxicity and adverse reaction, seizure reoccurring during the rewarming phase. And combination treatment with hypothermia and antiepileptic drugs may be useful, but must be approached with very caution. It's important to identify antiepileptic drug dose and dose interval that are suitable for neonate during and after hypothermia. Let us start and talk about combination of hypothermia with phenobarbitone, which is considered to be the first line antiepileptic drug. The combination can give positive synergism of first line antiepileptic drug. It demonstrates improvement in neuropathology and sensory motor performance. 66% reduction in seizure was demonstrated for neonates treated with hypothermia with plasma concentration of phenobarb more than 20 mg per liter. The alteration in pharmacokinetic of phenobarbitone during hypothermia in neonates were not clinically significant and that a total maximum dose of 40 mg per kilo can be safely administered in hypothermia prior to second line antiepileptic drug. So therapeutic drug monitoring of phenobarb allow for tight control of antiepileptic drug concentration, which may be particularly important during hypothermia. What about combination of lidocaine and hypothermia? Lidocaine alone or with hypothermia as third line anticonvulsant to neonate with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy result in 91% response rate. Clearance of lidocaine is reduced by 24% as hepatic blood flow is reduced during hypothermia. And despite these changes, no cardiotoxicity was observed in hypothermic neonate when altered dose regimen equal to 70% of total lidocaine dose given to normothermic neonate was added. To pyramid and hypothermia, it was found that combination of topiramate and hypothermia improved motor and brain tissue damage in a model of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy where neither drug alone confer by neuroprotection. In a neonate, there was no statistically significant change in survival rate or brain damage observed within topiramate was given in combination with hypothermia when compared to hypothermia alone. Although the pharmacokinetic profile of topiramate is altered when administered during hypothermia treatment, these pharmacokinetic variations were not clinically significant. And the majority of the neonates are observed to have topiramate concentration within the safe effective concentration. Midazolam and hypothermia, the efficacy of midazolam as second line antiepileptic drug in seizing neonate with hypothermia treated is modest, achieving control only in 23%. The pharmacokinetic profile of midazolam in unit was not stat uh, significant, significantly changed by hypothermia. The incidence of midazolam-induced hypotension increase in unit undergo therapeutic hypothermia. So we have to be uh, looking carefully about blood pressure in this unit. Midazolam level in serum of asphyxiated infant, normothermic and hypothermic were found to be highly variable and unpredictable due to renal hepatic impairment caused by initial injury. Pumetonide and hypothermia, combination of phenobarbitone Bumotonide and hypothermia in neonatal population with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy induced seizure were not effective. None of these neonates achieved the requ uh, request 80% seizure reduction without the need for rescue antiepileptic drugs. 
if further studies is needed in this Phenytoin and hypothermia, unfortunately, there is no data from NUNATE with seizure on efficacy or safety of phenytoin and hypothermia together. There are many reports from trial on the use of phenytoin and hypothermia in older children, 2 to 16 years of age, and in adults for treatment of tra traumatic brain injury and decrease in metabolism of CYB2C9 and CYB2C19 resulted in reduction clearance compared to value obtained after rewarming. It was found that increased phenytoin levels are present both during and after rewarming, which increased the risk of toxicity even after hypothermia had finished and caused cardiac toxicity in terms of bradycardia and cardiac suppression. So in conclusion, the treatment of neonatal seizure remains suboptimal and it is really a challenge. There is no protocol for treatment of neonatal seizure based on the underlying etiology. And treatment algorithms are based on minimal trial data on older generation drugs. Phenobarbitone remains the first line antibiotic for of choice despite suboptimal efficacy, altered underlying pharmacokinetic in immature brain. There is no consensus on replacement of first line drug or even on the most efficacious and suitable second line antibiotic. We don't have randomized control trial to guide treatment regimen in neonatal seizure which hold progress, progress in the field, and we are in a bad need for a randomized control trial in this regard. There are multitude of drug-drug and drug hypothermia interaction that remain to be elucidated, including the efficacy, safety of antiepileptic polypharmotherapy in neonatal seizures. And until the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic profile of antiepileptic medication in hypothermia are sufficiently investigated, therapeutic drug monitoring of serum antiepileptic level is encouraged. The efficacy of antiepileptic treatment protocol should always be measured using continuous EEG monitoring. And by this slide, the uh, uh, my talk is concluded. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Raida, for this uh, comprehensive uh, lecture. Thank you. Raida, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Hi, hi, how are you? How are you, alhamdulillah? <laughs> So uh, thank you very much for this uh, for this lecture. And uh, now we have uh, some question. So um, the first one is uh, a major problem in uh, several uh, several countries in our region. And uh, uh, phenytoin and intravenous phenytoin is no more available in some country in our region. So could uh, Lokazamid be tried? Uh, thank you very much for this question, which is important. Uh, I, I mean, we uh, uh, lacosamide has been tried in very limited uh, uh, number of new need, and there are only case reports. It it sounds to be uh, encouraging. However, we don't have any enough data. Uh, it seems like it is more safe. It's safer drug than uh, phenytoin and even phenobarbitol, but uh, unfortunately, the data in the literature is limited. Only uh, in any, it was found on uh, reported cases. Um, unfortunately, any, it is amazing how many years we have been using the anti uh, neonatal antiepileptic drugs, and all of us knows that. Phenobarbitol and phenytoin are like how much uh, damage can cause to this immature brain, and it's so frustrating. 
that till now we don't have any alternatives. And we hope like in the near future, we can have like something will work for uh, neonatal seizures and to be efficacious. At one point we were thinking maybe uh, Levetiracetam can be replacing uh, phenobarbitone. Unfortunately, head-to-head uh, uh, -head trial found phenobarbitone still is more efficacious. So, and it remained to be the first line of treatment for a patient who had neonatal seizures. So, we don't know about lacosamide. The data is limited. So, uh, I think we need more studies to uh, answer this question properly. Thank you. What do you think about uh, levetiracetam? Uh, the efficacy, perhaps phenobarbital, is more efficient, but uh, the, uh, the um, uh, effect, side effect, is more important. And levetiracetam, some study uh, showed that with levetiracetam, with the high doses, about 50 to 60 milligram per kilo per, per day, it is, um, it is also effic uh, efficient. I said that because in Tunisia, example, we uh, and in uh, in our neonatal department, we move to uh, to use the levetiracetam, uh, um, and we uh, now we prefer to use levetiracetam than phenobarbital. But we, we use uh, more higher doses. Yeah, I agree with you. Many studies showed even like even sixty milligram, uh, even higher. Uh, some uh, data they said 80 milligram, which is considered to be very high. Uh, high. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know. I think it will be challenging and uh, to do studies to compare this high dose of levetiracetam to uh, uh, phenobarbitone because uh, levetiracetam, the good thing that it is well tolerated with less side effect, but the problem with the efficacy. Phenobarbitone, it has a lot of side effects, uh, but it is more uh, efficacious. Yes, I agree. So uh, it is an idea to have a multicentric study in our region so we can, uh, we can determine uh, which is the best. Sure. Another question also, in the case with neonate with renal issue, what is the recommendation for using the vitiracetam in status epilepticus? Uh, if they have any, uh, uh, we know that the patient, the most common cause of neonatal seizures is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And these patients, in uh, uh, many of the cases, can have multi organ failure, uh, renal, hepatic. And in these cases, still phenobarbitone will be the first, any versus uh, levetiracetam as uh, uh, treatment uh, can be used to treat their seizures. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the thing is that in this patient, you would need to monitor the dose very well and monitor the renal function carefully. But it will any that uh, management of neonatal seizures in this patient it shouldn't be changed, but we need to monitor the renal function carefully. So uh, one question was the, about um, about carbamazepine, the use of carbamazepine in neonate neonate period. Classic. Yeah, very, yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, very uh, challenging question, and uh, uh, many studies has been uh, uh, studied in these uh, babies, especially uh, those who had familiar uh, uh, familiar benign neonatal seizures who develop the seizure, they call it fifth day fits, uh, due to KCNQ2 or KCNQ3. And uh, it, it found to be working very well in these patients. So it's, and it's promising, probably considered to be the drug of choice. So uh, carbamazepine or oxcarbamazepine can be helpful in certain types of neonatal seizures associated with certain uh, uh, genetic uh, type, especially KCNQ2. Absolutely, especially KCNQ2, but uh, uh, in the neonatal period, it's okay, but uh, after the age of three months, we need to be uh, careful because uh, we can exacerbate epileptic spasm. So 
in the new unit, yes, we can we can use it for this. Uh, we have a bad experience with carbamazepine in this uh, uh, in this uh, interval of uh, of age, and with Olivier Dulac, uh, we have the dogma that we 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 need to don't use carbamazepine before the age of one year. But now with the genetic mutation and genetic study, uh, we we can use it in in neonatal and um, in neonatal period only in neonatal period. So another question: uh, How long do you leave uh, the anti-epileptic drug if the seizures stop it in a neonatal neonate with ischemic lesion? Uh, so the duration of use of anti-epileptic drug is always uh, uh, a question and uh, uh, always our aim is to try to stop these antiepileptic drugs even before we discharge them from the nursery ICU, especially if the patient is on phenobarbital. So in some cases we cannot, so a uh, patient will be evaluated after two to three months and this is the aim. If he is seizure free uh, before discharging from the nursery ICU, it can be stopped easily. If not, uh, uh, we follow up these patients after two to three months and uh, uh, evaluate the patient. And most of them you need, by that time, we will be able to stop these antiepileptic drugs. Uh, we look also uh, for uh, the EEG, MRI, and this will help us to determine if uh, we can stop the, uh, these medications early or they might be continued on it for some time. Some of these patients might, de wow. might develop uh, other seizure types like a spasm or uh, later on. Um, we have a patient, many patients that we stopped it. They, they remain seizure free. And then after a few months, they develop the spasm. But I don't think any, uh, there is no uh, any harm to stop this medication, which is recommended as early as possible. And if you have an abnormality in EG? Uh, if the patient is seizure free, um, uh, we usually look for, we treat patient not EEG. Yes. Uh, so, uh, it's possible for the, with the family to stop, uh, to stop uh, anti-epileptic seizure with, uh, uh, with uh, abnormal EEG. It's a very challenging situation with the family. Right. So, yes. So another question, do you assess evidence of, or uh, of clinical or electric seizure before disconnected emission, you you already answer uh, or electrical seizure before discontinuation. Yes, I think you already answer uh, this uh, this uh, question. So thank you. I think uh, this is uh, all uh, the question. Thank you very much, uh, Raida. It's nice to see you. Me and. Too. Uh, with this uh, session, we finish the first uh, first part of our program, and we will start uh, uh, the next program of uh, Eastern Mediterranean webinar on March. And uh, on March, we will um, we will have a joint uh, Africa and Eastern Mediterranean webinar. So see you in the next uh, program, and uh, have a nice. Uh, uh, end of the day. Thank you very much, Aida. And you are welcome. Day, inshallah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you so all the, the present and all the attendees and see you for the next, uh, uh, next uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ma'asalaam, Abdulaziz.